That's it. All right. Thanks for joining us. We are live with <laughs> Mayor Rudolph Giuliani for one hour this evening. We are asking folks to uh, submit your questions. Ask me anything with Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Thanks for joining us live. Here and we on a number of our social media platforms, including Instagram, YouTube, and Getter tonight. Mayor, any opening remarks on your first live stream? Well, I guess my opening remarks are uh, will we'll, uh, suggest a few of the things we can we can certainly uh, talk uh, talk about. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything that is more prominent or more. Uh, uh, unfortunately universal in the United States right now than the uh, significant amount of crime that's going on. So um, if, if you want to talk about that, that is obviously a subject that I have, I have a great deal of experience with uh, uh, in New York and also in the United States and around the world. I spent a lot of my last 20 years solving crime problems in various parts of the world and then before that in the United States. Election, the 2022 election is, you know, ongoing at this point, right? People are voting in some states, not in all. And um, there are a number of very close races and a number of uh, issues that are, dr are driving it. Crime is one of them. In uh, some states, it's the number one issue, like mine in New York, and some it's number two. Most states, probably the economy is the number one issue. So we can discuss that. We can discuss the condition of the president. I mean, the, the uh, strange uh, interlude on television on Sunday where he, I couldn't tell after analyzing it whether he fell asleep or he lost uh, the, the question, meaning he forgot the question, which I should tell you is a significant, uh, the, the significant uh, symptom of, of um, of some form of dementia. Uh, that's not for me, it's from the doctors I interviewed for my podcast a year ago, who did a rather complete analysis of Joe Biden's speech patterns over the last 10 years and how they've significantly changed. One of the things they warned about is uh, loss, of, loss of recent memory, but memory so recent as it's the last thing you said and you can't remember it, which usually indicates uh, the onset of very, very significant dementia. Now, so if you, take, if you take a good look, and we can replay it if you want a little later, uh, if you take a good look at or listen to uh, the uh, way in which he uh, reacted, it's hard to tell whether he was asleep or he didn't get the question. He forgot the subject they were on. And then he fumbled his way back to his wife but I, I mean, the long and short of it is there's clearly something very, very wrong with him. And I think it's completely irresponsible that we're not doing anything about it. I mean, this country, this country is uh, surrounded by uh, all kinds of threats. Uh, we're being, uh, in many ways, bullied by China and accepting it. Um, uh, the, 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 the mental acuity of the president, the mental capacity of the president is enormously important and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be so afraid uh, that we're not going to raise it when he seems to nod out in the middle of a national interview or can't remember that a congresswoman who he's going to have a ceremony for the next day is dead and starts looking for her, which was only two of the things that have happened, and I don't know if you, if any of you people watch Australia television, but I mean Joe Biden is a yeah, constant source of ridicule. They play all of these things that we, uh, many of which we miss in the United States, because with all of it, he still has a very um, sycophantic press. Thanks again for joining us live with Mayor Rudy Giuliani to submit a question. Um, please comment uh, below. Let us know what your question is. You can ask the mayor anything. Uh, and uh, we'll start uh, getting into some of the questions that we're getting. Uh, outside New York City, your favorite city in America? 
probably Chicago, because it's so much like New York City. <laughs> there you have it. Chicago is the mayor's second favorite city, and I believe that might even be a nickname. The second city. Yeah, it no longer is the second city. I think L.A. is the second city now in terms of population. But for many, many years, Chicago was the second city uh, with a population of approximately 3 million to New York's. Well, it varied at various times from 7.8 to 8.5 million. Right now, it's about 8.3 million. And that's just the city of New York, uh, not, this, not the metropolitan area, which is about 13 or 14 million. We have a question here. Mayor, is it safe for me and my family to visit New York City? Yes, it's safe to visit New York City. Uh, the, the reality is it's not as safe as it was two or three years ago. It's not as safe as it was uh, four or five years ago. It is safer than most other large cities, even now with the crime wave that's going on because it had become so safe. So, for example, if you look at the chance the horrible statistic about the chance of being murdered in New York is significantly less than my second favorite city, Chicago, significantly less than Philadelphia, Rochester, New York, um, St. Louis, Missouri. It, it, is, it is still one of the safest large cities in America in terms of homicide. The crime that's, in, in fact, homicide has gone down a little this year. The, a crime that is, the crimes that are increasing at staggering rates are property crimes, uh, theft of stores, um, also random attacks, uh, not necessarily fatal attacks, but very, very injurious attacks. Sometimes they're fatal. So, and they are growing, but because the crime level in New York had been so low, if you look at the actual numbers, New York per capita is still safer than Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, most of the cities you, you, would, you would compare it to. Diane says, when you were there, I was a cop, and the prisoners were always afraid of you. They called it Giuliani time. Yeah, that's the way it should be. Uh, sh sh shouldn't the prisoners be afraid of the authorities uh, since they violate the law and try to hurt the people that the authorities are trying to protect? What we've done is uh, we, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, almost as a whole, has reversed uh, where our first loyalties go. Our first loyalties now go to the criminal. And the victim is somewhere way down on the list. Uh, that's the whole idea of uh, don't have a cash bail, let people out. Gosh, uh, they shouldn't be in jail. They shouldn't spend too much time in jail. And then the reality is that many of these people are what we call career criminals. And every day they're out of jail, they're crime, crime machines. So I would, uh, this, is a, this is a rough uh, 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 this, this is a rough estimate, not to be uh, considered scientific, but, but descriptive, which is, I would say, most people would say that right now, New York City is going through its crime epidemic, which is quite significant for New Yorkers because they're not used to this in 20 years. Uh, they had a 50% increase in homicide two years ago. They had a 30% increase in homicide last year. This year, homicide's down a little, but they have a 40% increase in property crime. They have a 45% increase in crime in the subways. Those are big increases, 40%, 45%. The number is still lower than it used to be in the bad old days and lower than the other Democrat cities in which uh, crime is even more out of control. But New York City is safe, but uh, like, uh, like every other city now in America that where you, I mean, you put a Democrat mayor uh, in, in, uh, and you team the Democrat mayor with a Soros district attorney and you've got massive crime right now. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if the American people realize it, but Soros spent millions and millions of dollars over the last seven years electing district attorneys in cities he has no connection with. And they're not district attorneys. They're they are very, very uh, committed uh, defenders of criminals and basically set criminals free. So you take a city like Philadelphia. Philadelphia is now um, challenging last year under Larry Krasna, who is the Soros Purchase District Attorney, challenging uh, Philadelphia for a record you don't want to have, which is last year Philadelphia had more murders than ever before in the history of Philadelphia. 
at 408 murders this year, they're challenging that record and might very well have more murders this year than ever before in their history. That's a very, very, and, and other crimes are up 40%. We have a police department that has total disregard for the district attorney. And we have a district attorney that probably turns down more than half the cases. And then even when he takes them, he generally lets people out, even if they've committed serious crimes. He is a uh, menace um, and has to be some kind of anarchist that wants to see the destruction of the city of Philadelphia because he is just single-handedly destroying the city of Philadelphia. Now, what I just told you, the local Democratic Party would tell you. They opposed him for re-election because he's getting their sons and daughters killed. But Soros came in with two, three million dollars and overrode the uh, Democrat Party and got him re-elected. Re but now he's, he's in the middle of a, one of those recalls like they succeeded with in San Francisco and are attempting in Los Angeles. And both those people were Soros-elected district attorneys. The connection to Soros has not been really adequately made because he's very heavily protected by the legacy media. Awesome. Well, Mayor, uh, a number of folks have asked, and you've kind of answered with some of your comments how you could uh, take on the current crime crisis and what you've kind of... Uh, identified some of the issues. Maybe we talk about some of the steps you took. People are very curious. We're getting a lot of questions in real time. You know, you're given a lot of credit for cleaning up the streets of New York, making Manhattan what it is today, a place people can visit and feel safe from, you know, 80th from, Street, from, 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 entire, um, almost the entire from island. the kind of crimes we see on television yes, now every, yeah. every night. So we know, folks know about the broken window theory. Uh, can you kind of talk about that and yeah, share yeah. with people your thoughts? Let's hear from the, the man himself. The, the, there are several critical steps that have to be taken that are universal. In other words, these always have to be done if you want to bring down crime. After that, it becomes something very, very individual to the city involved because there are different kinds of crimes in different cities and different... Um, and different history of, of criminality, which means the enforcement has to be different. But this is universal. In order to solve the crime problem, you have to understand it. The only way you can really understand it in a way in which you can make rational choices and decisions about your resources is if you quantify it. In other words, you need statistics. You need to know uh, where crime is taking place, what time it's taking place, what kind of crime, the number of people that are involved, uh, the crime complaints have to be, uh, by the police, have to be very accurate to the extent that they're not, you're going to make the wrong decisions. And uh, uh, f f fighting crime is like fighting a battle in a, in a, in a, in a multifaceted war. Uh, and uh, s second, th th we call that the Comstat program. It's uh, keeping very, very accurate and I wouldn't say really complicated statistics, but, you know, 20, 30 factors about each crime that goes into uh, the computer in the police station when the arrest uh, takes place or the crime is reported. And then you analyze that every day in the entire city so that you, you, uh, you, see, you see crime. You see, you see where it takes place, when it takes place, where it's moving, how it's moving. Uh, and then you also see the placement of your police. Do you have them in the right place? Do you have them at the right time? They're at the right time. Do you have the right kind of police? So let's say in an area you now have a significant amount of auto theft, which is maybe the most rapidly increasing index crime in the country right now. Most cities that I'm talking about, these Democrat cities with Soros district attorneys, are looking at 40 and 50 percent increases in, in motor vehicle theft. Uh, so that, that needs its own strategy. You don't fight motor vehicle theft with the same strategy that you fight purse snatchings or pickpocketing or home invasion. Or, But first, you've got to know about it. You've got to know where it is. You have to know how extensive it is. And you have to, you have to, um, you have to simplify your task by... Some people like to call them, in, uh, uh, particularly in the South American countries that I worked in, and the ones where we had the most success, they used to call them hot zones. So they, they, they take a city like uh, uh, 
you pick at, I mean, pick any 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 city you want. Mexico City is probably not a good example because it's so big, and and the police department is so corrupt. Um, but you take some of the cities in Colombia where you have a very very good police department. So you divide the city and into the areas where most of the crime is taking place, and you concentrate your resources in those areas to bring crime down. But because you have a good statistical computer system to follow it, you follow them as they flee to other parts of the city. So uh, in the case of New York, when I took over, uh, after uh, really, I mean, we uh, almost a year of study of those statistics and knowing them as well as I knew baseball batting averages, um, the, uh, it was obvious that the cr cr there was one part of New York City, which is very large, it's, New York City is really a confederation of five counties of New York State, that more crime was taking place in one half of one borough than any place else in the city. It had the most crime, it had the most drug crime, and how about this? It exported the most crime. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean was, if you, if you uh, analyzed it another way, there were more criminals from the northern part of Brooklyn committing crime in other parts of the city than there were criminals from other parts of the city committing crimes anyplace else. They were exporting the most crime. So they committed the most crime in their area, which is the northern part of Brooklyn, and in many of the other areas of the city that had high crime, they were contributing more to crime there than any other part of the city. So it became uh, clearly the natural area for the first major crackdown, the first major infusion of large police resources geared to the crimes being committed there. Because in doing that, you would reduce crime there and you would reduce crime elsewhere because you'd be catching the people who are committing crimes elsewhere. However, uh, when the first department first, police department first presented that to me, I rejected the plan. And I rejected the plan because there was no follow-up attached to it. The plan was a plan that contemplated what we needed and what we would do to stop it in the northern part of Brooklyn. And then we'd figure out what we were going to do. And I uh, sent it back to the drawing boards for another four months so that we could, we could, we could design a complete plan. Like, where are we going to go next? And how are we going to decide where we go next? And what are we going to leave behind? So by the time we unveiled the plan, we were bringing crime down in northern Brooklyn and watching where it migrated so that we could quickly reassign resources there so that that got the same crackdown as the northern part of Brooklyn. And we reduced then the number in the northern part of Brooklyn, but kept an adequate force behind sounds a little like uh, the wars of occupation, doesn't it? Uh, except I think we fought it a lot more successfully than it was fought. And I often thought that some of the things that we did uh, would have been helpful, but there's, a, there's not an awful lot of sharing that goes on uh, in this country. Be, uh, I must say, I borrowed from every mayor and governor that would help me. I mean, I borrowed uh, my welfare pro program from Governor Thompson of Wisconsin because it was so successful. I even stole his director of, uh, I mean, stole, it was a, a mutual decision and Tommy was very good enough to give him to me. But uh, I learned it from him. Um, the Adopt-A-Highway program, I, I borrowed from uh, Mayor Reardon of, um, of uh, Los Angeles. And now, on the other hand, uh, uh, Governor Bush and Mayor Daley borrowed their emergency management program from us after 9-11 uh, because it was, so, uh, it was so successful. It was such a good program and, and actually sent people to watch it, look at it, and then model it in Chicago and in Florida. And that's the, that's the uh, program you saw operate so brilliantly for Governor DeSantis. It really was started by Governor Bush, who uh, met the test in 2004 with four hurricanes in three weeks. And uh, you don't even remember it because their emergency management system was, was so good um, as compared to some other places that, that had a very immature emergency management system. Did, did uh, you came in there and you made some changes within the police department. Did you 
Did you face some pushback initially? Oh, did I face pushback? I sure did. Not only did I face a pushback, but I've, but my police commissioner and his staff did, and that's why I hired a police commissioner from outside of New York City. I hired Bill Bratton, who I think everyone knows. Bill came from Boston. And imagine hiring a police commissioner in New York from Boston. Uh, uh, particularly, I could get away with it because I was I, I am known as the number one Yankee fan. But um, I hired Bill uh, specifically to have somebody take a new look at the police department. Even though there were people in the New York City Police Department that I would have considered normally as talented, possibly more talented, uh, but not, not at that time and in that place for the kind of reform that was necessary. Uh, but then when it started moving in the right direction, my next police commissioner was a, a, a man who was highly organized and very institutional and very able to institutionalize changes, which wasn't one of Bill's strains. And then my third commissioner was e extremely good at motivation. And it was a police department that was, you remember when President Trump used to say, we're gonna win too much? It was a police department that was winning too much. We, we were starting to rest on our laurels and I hired Bernie Carrick, who, was, who himself was one of the most heroic police officers, had medals for just about everything was enormously respected by the street cop. And while he was police commissioner, he made five fairly major arrests as the police commissioner, which is rare, but you can't imagine what that did for the morale of my police. He also was a, uh, an expert on uh, terrorism, it turned out, because he worked in the Middle East uh, in the earlier part of his career. And he ended up being the commissioner on 9-11, which was of enormous help. That's just the grace of God that we had him at the right time. I think later on here in the second half, we're getting a lot of questions surrounding 9-11. Of course, a whole generation of Americans uh, know the mayor for that. Uh, before we get to that, we, we have a few more questions here kind of in the political uh, realm. Who did you get along with better, George Pataki or Chuck Schumer? Oh, my goodness, George Pataki, of course. I mean, and, uh, it, I'm, 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 fixing the, um, I'm fixing the getter thing there, so we have a bit of an interruption. Ted, did you get it in there? Okay. So now we have to make sure Getter is still on. Yep. Something it went off there. Okay. Chuck Schubert or George Pataki? Well, I got, I got along better with, uh, with, with, um, with George Pataki. You might ask that question because my relationship with George Pataki started off uh, kind of rocky because I did something very unprecedented and very unpopular among Republicans. I, I endorsed uh, Mario Cuomo for re-election in 1994, and I did it because I had many more commitments from Mario Cuomo on what he would do for my city that at that time was, uh, when I took it over, it was probably technically bankrupt or teetering on it, and it took about a year to fix that to a year and a half. And um, uh, uh, Cuomo, having been governor for a long time, had a much better understanding of what we needed, and uh, George, who I didn't know well, uh, wasn't as willing to make the same commitments. And uh, I also had some concerns about some of the people uh, 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 with him. So I endorsed Cuomo, Cuomo lost. So it took a few years to reestablish or establish a relationship with George Pataki, but I did. And he was, a, was and uh, I consider him to this day to be a very, very fine governor and a very fair one. And, on, and then when September 11 happened, we really bonded because we basically governed together for two straight, two and a half months. We did something unprecedented, which I think both he and I would recommend to anyone in a situation like this. Uh, you can recall, I think maybe during the pandemic, uh, some of the problems governors and mayors would have. We had it terribly in New York between Mario Cuomo's son, Andrew, and, and uh, who was the governor, and de Blasio, who was the mayor, they were both Democrats, but they fiercely disliked each other, never got over it, and never cooperated, which is one of the reasons New York's response was probably one of the worst in the country. Um, that's really the answer to Katrina, the mayor and the governor, the mayor of New Orleans and the governor of Louisiana, although both Democrats were political opponents within, within the party, and uh, they never cooperated with each other. I knew that was going to be a failure when I saw the governor in Baton Rouge 
and the mayor in New Orleans, and they weren't together. And I said, well, they're going to start fighting. Uh, what uh, George and I did was, uh, after I, I, I was missing for a while, and the governor thought I was dead, and actually began the process of replacing me, um, which I only learned years later, he and, he and my deputy, my deputy Rudy Washington, you know, told me about it. But when I called the governor for the first time after we got out of the place we were trapped, he said, my goodness, we were really worried. We thought we had lost you. And uh, I, never, I never really focused it on then, focused on it much then. Af and afterwards I realized they were, they were, I was missing for about a half hour to 45 minutes and people had incorrectly identified me as going into a building that got uh, a very, very, um, if not destroyed, really hit very, very hard. Instead, we were in a building that got hit very hard and got blocked, but didn't get destroyed. So we eventually got out. But he thought we were gone. Uh, as soon as uh, he knew <laughs> that we weren't, uh, we said we would meet at the uh, police academy, set up a emergency uh, center, and decided that we would govern together. What that means is we had our staff meetings together, we made our decisions together, we made our decisions in the open, in a conference room, with the appropriate bureaucrats and, and, and the pe people around. And I, I'll tell you exactly why, because the biggest problem that happens in one of those joint operations is the staff starts to fight with each other more than the principals. And the staff becomes very uh, jealous to protect their principal uh, or themselves. And if something goes wrong, they're going to stop pointing fingers. Now, there's no time in an emergency to point fingers. You have to take all the responsibility. And the governor and I both instinctually understood that, agreed on it. And every decision that was made was a joint decision. So every decision that was a good one, we were both right. And every decision that was a bad one, we were both wrong. And to this day, nobody really knows because I don't think he's told them or I told them who made which decisions. And in most cases, I, we agreed. There were very few that we, where there was any form of disagreement. Well, well, can we... Let's, even, even if there was, we weren't going to tell anybody that. So let's, let's talk about that. I don't think that's something well, a lot of people it know. It comes from putting the city and the state and the people first. It's not about... It, if, if an emergency like 9-11 or the pandemic can't get you above your narcissism, then you're really ready for the nuthouse. I mean, you're really not a capable public official. I don't know well, if you're a hey, capable look. human being. I mean, when you see people dying and it doesn't move you to, I, I've, got to now, uh, I, I've got to now do what's best for them, not what's best for me, then you don't belong in public office. So... Let's let's talk about that morning again. We're getting a lot of questions on uh, September 11, 2001, of course, and um, you've mentioned some some of the I don't know if they're lessons learned or s some of the things you took from that and have shared around the world uh, to to countless groups and organizations um, post 9/11. Um, that morning, you say there was a time where you were you were missing, and people thought you were gone. Can you kind of walk through the the first kind of what happened that the, the uh, that morning? Sure, sure. I mean, what um, what happened was I went to the uh, police, the fire department command post, which was right at the base of the of the World Trade Center to make sure that the the fire department had uh, all the equipment and that it needed and that everything uh, was being coordinated with all of the other agencies of the city, most particularly the police department. So I brought the, I joined the police commissioner at the site shortly after the second plane hit and went right below the, f the North Tower where um, the fire department was, was, was stationed as their command, as their, um, what would you call it, their, their, their front leaning uh, uh, command post right on the site. And I directly communicated with uh, with them as to what they needed. Do you, do you have all the people that you need? What kind of help do you need from uh, the other agencies of the city? This is after the second plane had hit? Yeah, or maybe um, within five minutes of that. So after the first plane hits, potentially an accident. You're not necessarily First plane hit, I was having breakfast at uh, the Peninsula Hotel. I was informed that a plane hit the North Tower and that it was a very bad fire, but it was described as a twin-engine plane. 
as I'm driving down there and watching the huge amount of flame and fire and my, uh, my, my counsel, De Dennis and Young and I, he was the one with me, uh, uh, doubted that it was a twin engine plane because the fire was just too big uh, for that. And of course, immediately uh, the possibility, even with a twin engine plane of terrorism mm -hmm. comes to your mind because I was much more knowledgeable as the mayor of New York City about the terrorist threat to the city than the public, which, which knew nothing really about it at that time. Now, I was knowledgeable about it for a couple of reasons. First of all, I was the U.S. attorney there before I was the mayor and prosecuted terrorism cases. Uh, so I, I, I knew all the intelligence going into being mayor. Second, the head of the FBI at the time was a former assistant U.S. attorney of mine, movie free, who, who, you know, was very generous in making available to me in the police department all the intelligence he appropriately could. And finally, I was having a big trial in New York of, of uh, Islamic terrorists with numerous threats to bomb different parts of the city that had been going on for about a year, a year and a half. So I had, at that point, uh, the entire area around the, um, this is before the attack, the entire area around uh, the stock exchange, the entire area around the courthouses where the trial was taking place, and the whole area around City Hall, I had that completely uh, blocked, cut off. You had to uh, get a special pass to get in there. A uh, great deal of criticism of that because I never really revealed in great detail the absolute necessity for it. Um, I revealed the fact that it was necessary and you just got to trust me. Um, and of course, being a Republican in a Democrat city, a lot of the media, particularly the New York Times, didn't trust me and criticized me for doing it. Afterwards, they kind of apologized for it, but not really. So you uh, had that morning already I know it was numerous memorized. threats. I mean, I, here, here's the difference. After, after the first plane here, or the second plane? No, here's the difference. First plane, it was either, an, it was either a, a madman, an accident, or a terrorist. But if it was a terrorist, I had no doubt it was Bin Laden because I had that intelligence. I, I knew he was seeking to attack us, us meaning the U.S., not just New York. And I knew New York was one of those places that was very much on their minds. Uh, most Americans really didn't know who Bin Laden was, even well-informed ones, and most Americans had no idea how uh, powerful al-Qaeda was. Uh, I was enormously critical of President Clinton's response to him, uh, not as much publicly as privately, uh, because, I mean, somewhat publicly, but because I thought it was an invitation to further attack. My, uh, I wrote a book called Leadership, and I have a chapter in the book called Stand Up to Bullies, and it's based on the experience that we should have learned from Hitler and Mussolini, and um, uh, we, we, we gave Bin Laden the impression of a paper tiger because when uh, he destroyed one of our naval ships, which is an act of war, our response was to bomb a couple of empty fields. Um, so I think Bin Laden uh, went into September 11, uh, never, never expecting what, what uh, George Bush would do to him. Uh, but uh, I knew the difference between the two. In fact, um, I hate to be terribly political, but I've revealed this in the book. Uh, during the attack, when we knew it was a terrorist attack, I said, thank God Gordon get elected. You said that during the attack? Absolutely. And to this day, I, you know, it's one of it's, the reason I'm a Republican and change with the Democratic Party goes back to the fight against communism. And I began to see the Democrat Party as becoming an unrealistically a party that's unrealistic about communism, unrealistic about the threat of war, uh, and therefore, you know, sort of bungled their way into a lot of problems for us. What, um, when did it really sink in what happened that day? I mean, you're, in, you're the mayor of the city, so you're instantly, oh, you have a million different tell. things. I don't know when it sunk in. It didn't, it, it um, yeah, probably days later. I mean, I, went, I, mean, I was uh, on autopilot. When did you first get some sleep? Probably that, probably between um, 3 30. And five in, in in the morning of the of the twelfth, I mean, I got I got home 
about two in the morning, couldn't sleep, and went and read a, 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 a new book that I had just gotten about uh, Winston Churchill, who's a hero of mine. And I read the chapters about the Battle of Britain because I was looking for an analogy. I was looking for, uh, I was looking for a situation that would be, um, that'd be similar to what we were going through. Because I'm a very big believer. When I had, I'd been through cancer a year before. Uh, pe one of the things that was very helpful to me and gave me a lot of strength were the people that had been through cancer. And then I could say to myself, if they went through it, I, I can go through it. So I used that as a theme with the people of the city. If the people of Israel can go through what they're going through, we can go through what we're going through. I had been in Israel uh, uh, right after the bombing of uh, a bus in, in Jerusalem and ridden the bus with Mayor Omer to show the people of Jerusalem not to be afraid. And what I brought back uh, with me was the people of Jerusalem showed me not how not to be afraid because they weren't afraid. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so um, you you responded with that. And can you talk about uh, what did you learn about people throughout this? Or I mean, It's something that, right, it's a once in a lifetime. Yeah, oh, no, there's no question. I, I, what did you a learn lot, about human nature? A lot of my assumptions and a lot of my thinking changed as a result of September 11. Uh, I had actually pretty much completed a book called Leadership which were basically lessons that I had learned on leadership pre-September 11. And when the, it was over, I, I, I didn't publish the book. I held it up when I could, it took about four months to really be able to concentrate again. And I rewrote a good deal of it based on things that I now realized were different than what I thought. So it was a very, very, it was a very, very uh, powerful experience and one that uh, immediately uh, makes you humble. Immediately, I mean, I, when I saw the first man jumping from the 100, 100 floors, I said to my police commissioner, Bernie, we've never gone through anything like this before. It's way beyond anything we've ever done. We don't have a plan for it. We're going to have to make it up as we go along, use our instincts, and pray to God we're right. And what I meant by plan for it, we had 25 plans. Well, we thought we were prepared for every emergency imaginable. And we, we had them written out. We used to do this, uh, we used to do these exercises all the time. I, I actually thought at one point we were doing too many of them. And, um, but, you know, I found that although we didn't have a plan for it, all that planning and all that work helped a lot because um, whatever we did came from one of them. It just was a variation. So my, my advice to public officials is to prepare, prepare for any, everything you can think about. And then when the thing you didn't think about happens, you'll be prepared for that too. Or at least you'll be better prepared for it if you're prepared for everything you've thought about. Okay, and we'll do a, we'll uh, no doubt do more episodes and uh, discuss this in further detail. We're getting a lot of questions on a variety of topics. Um, and so let's get back to maybe what's coming up here at the midterm elections. Uh, we have a number of questions asking if you think Lee Zeldin can pull off the gubernatorial race here against incumbent Mrs. Kathy Hochul. I do, and I believe it's uh, about as critical as anything uh, uh, in the history of our state. I think that our state is at a turning point uh, and that it may never recover from. If it remains, it's had 20 years of Democrat rule. Uh, people outside our state might not know that the last two elected Democrat governors had to resign because of uh, major scandals, neither of which were really properly investigated, uh, but, it, but were substantial enough to have him leave office. Uh, you would think after 20 years of Democrat scandals and a governor who already has about four scandals involving, for example, building a stadium in Buffalo where a husband is going to make millions because... Uh, he is uh, one of the owners of the concession company. Um, and, of course, the, the, the liberal press covers it up the way they covered up the hard drive. So we, so we elected Joe Biden, where there's very substantial evidence of him being a major criminal uh, on the hard drive. Um, we're doing the same thing with Hochul. They're withholding the real information about her husband. Uh, the stadium is w way over uh, cost. Uh, 
Then, then you've got another situation with her where she, she, got, a, she got a $300 million contribution for someone, a company that she gave a $600 million contract to that is charging a, a two to three times more for a COVID test than is charged anywhere else, for example, in California. And this is her contributor who put in $300 million, which even in New York is a substantial amount of money. And then there are three or four more other scandals like this. She's, uh, she's a very much a product of what is a pay-for-play Albany that's really a swamp. If you think Washington's a swamp, Albany is uh, worse. Uh, Lee, on the other hand, is a very, very uh, honest, honorable person, uh, guy in the military. I think people will remember him as being involved in the Trump defense, which, of course, is being used against him. Uh, by the Democrats, uh, but he's far more capable than she is, far more honest. And most importantly, she's, got, uh, she's one of the creators of the crime problem by uh, supporting the bail bill, which uh, I don't know how to describe it to you other than about 50 to 60 percent of the people that should be in jail are, are let free by district attorneys under this law passed by the legislature and these district attorneys who are elected by vast amounts of money that are put in by George Soros. And they're not district attorneys at all. They are criminal defense lawyers who like to let criminals go free. People want to know why do you have so much crime in New York? And it, I mean, the simplified version of it is the people uh, who are committing the crimes are the people that used to be in jail when I was the mayor or Mike Bloomberg was the mayor. But these left wing uh, maniacs uh, uh, let them run around the streets. Now, that's the situation in Philadelphia. That's the situation in St. Louis. That's the situation in Los Angeles. That's the situation in uh, San Francisco. That's the situation in Portland, Oregon. That's the situation in Seattle. I can go on and on and on. And when they, even when they look at a Republican state with a Republican governor, it's the Democrat city with the Democrat mayor and their ridiculously indulgent attitude toward criminals and their totally dismissive attitude toward victims that is creating the vast amount of crime that we have in this country. It's not being caused by the atmosphere. It's not being caused by poverty. It's being caused by government programs. It's also being caused by the example of 2020 when uh, thousands and thousands of criminals invaded stores, stole what they wanted, and the police were not allowed to do anything about it. So that's why we have these store invasions now. It's also why... Uh, uh, of these uh, smash and grab situations that we never had before. The criminals learned that behavior by watching television in 2020, and the police were stopped, again, largely by progressive, haha, Democratic mayors and Soros type DAs from doing what you should do when people steal something from a store. They should be arrested. The police shouldn't be watching them do it. And when criminals see the police standing by watching, they are encouraged and become emboldened. And uh, any number of law enforcement experts will tell you whether the number of crimes is more now than it was 20 or 30 years ago or less, and it actually is less than 20 or 30 years ago, particularly in New York, not necessarily other places, what set records for crime. Uh, it's much bolder. It's much more arrogant. The, the criminal of my day, and there may have been more of them in New York, and in some ways they may have been more sophisticated and uh, worse criminals, but they weren't as bold. They actually were still afraid of the police. Didn't mean they didn't commit crime, but they didn't do it right in front of the cop. Right? So for, for a Republican to win in New York, let's talk about <clears> what? <throat> a statewide election. For a Republican to win statewide, about what percentage of New York City well, do they need? It's... Uh, very hard for a Republican to win state right, wide, right? We haven't had one in 20 years. George Pataki was the last, and he was an enormously skillful governor and politician. Uh, and Zeldin is a good um, match uh, for George. I mean, I would say uh, Zeldin is an equally talented um, uh, per, uh, per, per person. Uh, the only thing I can say is it's easier than be, being like a mayor, where the numbers are six or seven to one Democrat. It's basically two to one Democrat in the state. And we and uh, I was only like uh, the third Republican elected in the 20th century when I got elected. 
I was, I was only the second to remain a Republican. <laughs> Uh, one of one of my predecessors changed to Democrat while he was mayor. The pressure was so great. <laughs> and did you ever consider running, for example, for Senate in two thousand? I did. I considered running for Senate. Decided uh, I actually couldn't because I got prostate cancer. Ran for president in oh uh, seven and oh eight, um, and you know, obviously I, I lost to John McCain and supported him very very strongly. And we're down to about 15 minutes left, so get your questions in. And again, you can join us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. We're hitting record numbers. I mean, on the, our the, live the real show. frustration, uh, I will tell you, is when you sit here in my uh, 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 home in New York City, uh, knowing that I know how to do it and did it, and all the things that I did, they're doing the opposite. Uh, it is enormously frustrating. I saw. Ray Kelly on television yesterday talking about how much of a disaster this is. Now, Ray was not my police commissioner. He was Bloomberg's. He was a great police commissioner and carried on what we did and improved it. And I could see the frustration in his face because, I mean, uh, if Ray were the police commissioner, he'd fix it in two months. I mean, the, the, it's, it, the things they're doing are amateurish, immature, ideologically motivated, politically motivated, and stupid. And uh, unfortunately, they're costing us numerous lives. I mean, this weekend in Chicago, 50 people were shot. 10 people were killed. 78% of, of that record homicide in Philadelphia is African-American. Now, I mean, that's, uh, and where's Black Lives Matter about that? 72, 73% of the people killed in New York are African American. 74, 75% of the ones killed in Chicago. 50 shootings in Chicago last weekend, 10 dead. A combination dead and wounded, I think, six, 13 or 16 were juveniles. And without, we, we don't want to say I mean, this is, this is allowing the destruction of a specific group of people. How, what percentage of that would you say is pro likely black-on-black -black crime, and why is the media unwilling to, to talk about that? Because they're racist. They're real racist. They are really, really racist. They let race interfere with saving lives. I never let race interfere with saving lives. I'm not, I'm not going to engage in some kind of fiction that uh, makes a bunch of uh, stupid, ignorant liberals happy if it's going to cost somebody's life. So how did you deal with that? Well, I'll give you an example. So uh, at one point, uh, they, tried to, um, they tried to take over the New York City Police Department, uh, the Clinton administration did, because 70% of our searches were African Americans and uh, only 20% you know, of the population is African Americans. They said, well, surely that's prejudice. Well, surely it isn't when 76% of our violent crime is African American. I mean, their theory is as intelligent as, well, we should, we should search 52% of the women because they make up 52% of the population, but of course they commit only 8% of the crime. That's not a, that's not a, uh, what I was doing was racially neutral, colorblind, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say. I reacted to, if there was 70% of the crime here, I'm going to put 70% of the police there. Uh, I'm not going to spread them around, be, and, and I would get, I get, I get, I get uh, uh, a lot of criticism from the non-African American parts of the city because I was taking police away from there. And, but on the other hand, I reduced crime more than any mayor in the history of the city. I reduced crime more than any mayor in the history of America, and I saved more African American lives than anyone. I, uh, when you consider that I reduced homicide 65 percent. When I came in, it was two, over 2,000 a year averaging, and when I left, it was about 600. When you consider that 70 to 75 percent of those people that would have been murdered were African American, I actually did. I'm, I'm, I actually saved a heck of a lot more lives than any of them ever did. I also transformed Harlem, Bedford Stuyvesant, all these terrible areas that uh, were never transformed under the crooked politicians, black and white. Talk about, um, you know, working with uh, the city, the city council, how, you know, the setup of New York is interesting with the five boroughs. Uh, did you get along uh, with the city councils and the borough presidents and some of the different uh, leaders around the city? 
I, pretty much, yeah. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have a speaker of the city council, uh, Peter Malone, who was a great man, a Democrat, um, you, I'd have to say, and I, I, I think he would agree. And would, he's not someone who's changed like so many other Democrats have. Uh, he was a conservative Democrat. He, he represented an area that uh, voted for him and voted for me. Uh, he had a very, very left-wing city council. Uh, compared to today, it was a right-wing city council. <laughs> but compared to then, it was a very left-wing city council. Um, but um, with his guidance, I was able to work with him. Yeah. I mean, I, I passed a lot of laws. First of all, I reduced taxes with the Democratic city council. 44 Democrats and six Republicans, more than any mayor in history, um, created a surplus, got the city out of its perennial bankruptcy that it was in for years since since John Lindsay. And um, I couldn't have done that without getting a majority vote in the city council, which I would not have gotten had I had a speaker who thought of himself or herself and not the city. And, um, and then uh, so, the borough presidents, I, I, I got along with some better than others. Uh, one was a very, very strong, well, I mean, two were strong allies, the Republican borough president in Staten Island but he was also a close friend, and also Claire Shulman, the Republican, the Democratic borough president in Queens. The others, it varied with what I gave him or didn't give him, or what I was challenging, or in some cases, uh, you, you have to remember uh, that they couldn't have loved me a great deal because part of the way I became mayor is putting some of the borough presidents in jail. I mean, the borough president system and the Democratic Party system in New York then and now, it's thoroughly corrupt. Uh, in your They've owned the city for too long. It's, it's, impo it's impossible for a political party to own something as long as they've owned New York City. And, I mean, they never, re they never really fixed Tammany Hall. Uh, every, one, every once in a while, there'd be a reform, and then it would go back. I mean, uh, to, to this day, uh, bribes are paid. Uh, pe uh, people become judges because uh, Democratic county leaders select them. People think they elect the judges, but they only get on the ballot because the Democratic county leader picks the judge. So they're going to pick people that are politically responsive. Thanks for joining us again. We just have a few more minutes left, and you can tune in again tomorrow night, same time, same place, <laughs> uh, for a live with Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Mayor, we're getting a lot of questions. You know, you've lived a rich, a full life, uh, and there's still so much more to be written. Uh, a lot of folks are asking, what's next for the mayor? Uh, is he uh, contemplating any sort of dive into a, another <laughs> campaign? I'm not, I'm not contemplating right now. I'm contemplating the 22 election, and I, I, I feel frustrated we didn't talk more about it because there's plenty of time to talk about my past. There's only a couple of weeks uh, to talk about the election, and, and uh, when we come on next, I think I'd like to really delve into the election and... Uh, uh, where, where I see the, the, the vulnerabilities, the strengths, and, uh, and to the extent that people share my viewpoint, where they can be helpful. So comment below. We still have a couple more minutes left here. Comment below and let us know what races uh, and specific states you may want to hear the mayor discuss tomorrow uh, and, and throughout the week. Um, we spent a good deal of time on an extraordinarily important, important one, and uh, I'm glad we did, which is the one in New York, and it means a lot to me because... Uh, a lot of my legacy, and I might add um, uh, Mike Bloomberg's, uh, is, has been destroyed by these Democrats. And um, a governor can't really restore all of it because he doesn't run New York City, but he can point it in the right direction. For example, uh, the governor could remove our district attorney, who's a disaster. Our district attorney is probably, you know, along with, uh, along with Hochul and Cuomo and de Blasio and Adams, the mayor, I mean, these are the people responsible for the crime. He's the one putting the criminals out on the street. And, Mayor, uh, so what are some of the other races you are looking or you are all, watching? All, all the ones that you, that you are. I mean, I, I think the one in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, which is close by, is enormously important. Uh, not just the Senate race, which uh, I, I find it absurd that Fetterman is even running. It reminds me of Biden running. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden yesterday fell asleep during, during an interview. I mean, what, 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 what do we think Putin thinks when he sees our president fall asleep during an interview? And if he didn't fall asleep, he totally lost his train of thought, which is a major 
a major symptom of dementia. They're right there in the DSM. Why, why do you think the media covers for him? Why doesn't the media highlight because, this? Because the media is largely uh, cor corrupted uh, by ideology and education, I think. I mean, they're, they're left-wingers. They're Marxists to a very large extent. Uh, they're anti-government, and they're insanely, uh, pathologically anti-Republican. And then, uh, you know, it was always that way uh, for a long time, but it became an, il an illness and sickness with Donald Trump. I mean, after all, they sat by and watched uh, the Democratic Party frame him for a crime we now know he didn't commit, in which $45 million was spent, and Hillary Clinton paid to create the false allegations of Russian collusion. And the media d didn't just sit by and watch it, the media was complicit in it. And to this day, they've never really, and they're still pr promoting the liars who did that. The liars who did that are the people that are running the January 6th committee. The liars who lied about Russian collusion, the liars who said that, uh, that I was a Russian agent and Senator Johnson and Senator Grassley with the Hunter Biden hard drive, and it was a Russian disinformation, when it turns out 100% to be Hunter Biden's hard drive, not even disputed, and it turns out to be 100% valid. Those liars are the ones that are running the January 6th committee, and people like uh, Trump and me who are telling the truth about that are the ones they're attacking. It's a very, very strange thing. I don't know how often you get to lie about major things like trying to frame a president and get away with it. So we've had a couple of comments here. We've asked for folks to kind of talk about the race you'd like to see the mayor talk about uh, this week throughout the throughout the program. And a lot of folks are asking about Herschel Walker in Georgia. Oh, Herschel, Herschel, I think, did a great job in the debate. I watched that debate because there was so much pre pre pressure on it. I thought he really, really showed who the superior candidate is. And when they talk about his personal life, I think both personal lives should be taken out when you consider that uh, Warnock has, you know, uh, run over his wife, uh, has a background that uh, you, don't, you don't even want to talk about. And he, he clearly uh, was a defund the police radical who will just make Atlanta, I mean, uh, Atlanta is one of uh, the crime capitals of America and it's one of the most corrupt cities in America. It has a Democratic Party that's a uh, really a, gr a group of uh, uh, crooks. Just look at the number that have gone to jail. Uh, it's not. It's a, it's well known as a corrupt city, and um, he's not going to do anything about that. I mean, he's part of it. Um, all right, and so let us know any other races you'd like to hear the mayor talk about. Uh, you can visit uh, www.rudygiulianics. Dot com. And what does the CS stand for in it stands Rudy for Common CS. Sense and go to my podcast and uh, and keep in touch. Keep Thank in touch. You. Check us out across social media, YouTube, Twitter, Getter, Instagram, Facebook, Truth Social, and so many more. We'll be back. Join us again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Tell your friends. Tune in uh, for a lot more election coverage as we near the ever so important 2022 election. Thanks again. Good night. And we will see you tomorrow.